uh, which is, uh, yeah, we're being recorded by the way, uh, so everybody knows. And uh, today the topic is sons and daughters of working mothers, successes and challenges. So, uh, so many families are affected by um, how do you care for very small children or even older children? And uh, we hope to shed some light on uh, this very important topic uh, with our two speakers uh, uh, today. Uh, but before we uh, start, let me introduce some of the other board members. Uh, uh, Marsha Barlow is my fellow co-chair. She's uh, here today. Uh, we have uh, Lynn Walsh, our uh, recording uh, secretary, and uh, Sophia Pisuk, who is, um, um, <laughs> wears many hats. <laughs> She's responsible for the wonderful uh, flyers that we send out as uh, our corresponding secretary, and is also the one that uh, fills up your uh, inbox with uh, messages to uh, please attend our next meeting. So we're glad you did show up. So we're gonna start first um, uh, with um, uh, uh, our, our speaker is gonna concentrate mostly on the uh, uh, some of the good news we learned about sons of working mothers. And our first speaker is Kathleen uh, McGinn uh, from Harvard. Uh, she is the Con Rob Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. And uh, she has been there for, I think, over 20 years, uh, having different uh, uh, positions uh, throughout her career, and has also lectured uh, not only throughout the United States, but uh, uh, several places around the world. And in doing some of my research, I discovered that we have a friend in common at a business school in Spain, uh, whom I also invited to join us today, but unfortunately, she's teaching at this time. Um, so Kathleen, um, was the uh, spearheaded a wonderful program about uh, sons and daughters of working mothers. And I think it was later expanded um, to include um, uh, close to 30 countries. So we have an international dimension to this uh, presentation as well. And our second speaker is going to be uh, Catherine Stevens, uh, who spent many years with the um, uh, American Enterprise Institute uh, and I'll say a little bit more about uh, Catherine when I introduce her after Kathleen uh, speaks. So we're very much uh, excited to have both of you today. Thank you very much for agreeing to be here. And um, let's start with Kathleen. So please take it away with your wonderful presentation. Thanks for your introduction, Vinny. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to share the virtual stage with you, Catherine. Um, going to share my screen now. And as always with share screen, I'm going to make sure you can actually see what I can see and then I'll continue. Can everybody see this um, picture of a mom and her child and cross-generational gains from women's employment? Yes. All yes. right. And just that, right? You can't see all my cheat notes. Wonderful. Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, women's employment, as Vinny said, continues to be a lightning rod for policy discourse, for emotional debates inside homes, inside organizations, and across communities around the world. This debate is even more heated when we're talking about women employed during their sons' and daughters' childhood years. Mom's employment looms large in the debates in Congress over universal child care and family and medical leave. And reflecting these debates um, in the US, uh, women work at much lower rates than men. And in the EU 27, for example, the employment rates of moms with children under 12 years old is 10 percentage points lower than the rates for other women. In contrast, fathers with young children at home are more likely to be employed than men without children. And the gap is growing in many countries. All moms work. So I try to avoid the term working mom. My mom worked more than full time raising five children, helping in our schools, teaching adult education, being a master gardener, working on a suicide helpline and more. But all of her work was unpaid. Mom's unpaid work inside homes and within communities, within schools, doesn't spark debate, although perhaps it should. What sparks debate is mother's engagement in paid employment. 
Decades ago, early research suggested that adolescents raised by employed moms developed more egalitarian gender attitudes and that adolescent girls whose moms were employed expressed greater interest in pursuing their own careers. But those findings seem to be forgotten as gender gaps in higher education and employment started shrinking. So in the 80s and 90s, as women moved into the workforce in increasing numbers, scholars turned to testing the effects on young children. Relying almost exclusively on US data sets following children born in the 70s and 80s, there were dozens of studies that essentially showed no consistent negative or positive effects for maternal employment on young kids' social development, cognitive development, or behavioral development. In spite of women's increasing participation in paid labor, time diaries show that children now spend more hours actively engaging with their parents than they did in the 1970s when way more moms were at home. This reflects two things, both father's involvement, which is a wonderful thing, and a new emphasis on parents' active engagement with children. Children are no longer seen and not heard within households. But evidence about long-term life effects of being raised by moms who engaged in paid employment was largely absent. The few papers that did look at this before ours um, were from US samples only. This limited evidence from past research suggests a few things. First of all, that employed moms affect adult children's division of household labor. Um, that employed moms affect their adult son's decisions, especially in terms of their choice of wives. So adult sons raised by employed moms are more likely to be married to women who are also employed outside the home. And they affect their adult daughter's choices about paid employment. So my co-authors, Myra Ruiz Castro, from the UK, and Elizabeth Long Lingo from here in the US, and I set out to ask, whether there are any long-term effects on children associated with their mother's employment status, that is their paid employment status. We looked at maternal employment across the globe. We really wanted to know if maternal employment has lasting effects on children's lives as they become adults and make critical choices about their own families and their own careers. We're interested in outcomes at home as well as outcomes at work for adult sons and for adult daughters. We asked the question, how does a mother's paid employment affect the lives of her adult sons and daughters? And through this, how does it affect girls and boys in generations to come? My co-authors and I start out by acknowledging what you can think of as the sociology of employment. No one questions whether men's employment is good or bad for their children. I should restate that. Few question whether men's employment is good or bad for their children, for the men themselves, for their families, and for society. But as Linda Kerber said in her history of women's place, men's employment occurs within a gendered social order that balances on the notion that women are helpers, that women's true places in the home and that when they venture out of the home, they're best suited for caring work that replicates housework. Scholars acknowledge, and I think most of us here would agree, that women's employment reverberates to individual women, to their families, to organizations, and to communities because of this gendered social order. The distribution of paid and unpaid labor between men and women in a society reflects and reinforces the interconnectedness of the spheres of production and reproduction. Women's and men's employment occurs within this gendered social order that historically has assigned men responsibility for breadwinning and women responsibility for caretaking. And this acknowledgement that we build into our work leads to the organizing propositions for the work I'll talk about today, linking mothers paid employment to reverberations across generations. When women earn an income, their enhanced financial resources enrich their households and communities, potentially leading to increased investment in females in the next generation of potential income earners. 
Alongside income, women's employment shapes and is shaped within this normative realm. While this gender no order is subjective and tacit, it's well known and generally followed. Understanding the links between women's employment and the impact on the next generation requires a consideration of both the financial realm and the normative realm. In today's talk, I'm gonna talk about a few different uh, sets of data through which we were able to look at adult sons and daughters across 29 countries. Generally, what I'm gonna do is compare adult sons and daughters raised by moms who were employed outside the home and paid employment relative to those who were raised by moms who stayed at home full time. Now, again, it doesn't mean their moms were actually not working, but not engaged in paid employment. And we ask whether this time spent by the next generation in household tasks differs as a result of this and whether employment, again, in the next generation, sons and daughters differs. And if so, what might underlie these differences? Um, we, the name of our study is Learning from Mum. Uh, and we collected data from all of the countries that you see here. So data from Japan, for example, Latvia, Taiwan, the US, Chile. Um, the data were collected alongside national census surveys uh, collected in 2002, actually some were collected 2003 and 2012 and 2013. And the data come from approximately 50,000 uh, working age men and women that is between 18 and 60 years old. The findings replicated across the two samples um, in ways that uh, stunned even us. Uh, it's very tricky to think you're going to run a study a second time with a totally different set of data and get the same findings, but we did. So I'm going to uh, collapse across these studies and talk about them uh, as if it's one study. These are the averages. I just want to give you some kind of feel for the gender the ISP data only, so it's only for 24 countries. Um, this is 2002 and 2012. It's standardized by country and year. And the way to look at this is the midpoint in each one of these little graphs is, is zero. So think of that as the mean income in the country across those two years. And what you see for all of these is that men are above the mean income and women are below the mean income. Uh, it's it, it varies a lot. So you can see it's greater in Great Britain, for example, than in the US. Um, if you look at the data across years, so it's collapsed in years here, but the data across years suggests the gaps in many, but not all countries are shrinking. Um, so in Australia, for example, uh, there was a big shrinkage between 2002 and 2012 in this uh, gender gap in pay. Um, the gap held constant in other countries, for example, in the US and Russia. And in several countries like Germany, the gender gap in wages actually increased between 2002 and 2012. Our study seeks explanations for this variation in pay. There's a question of whether women are universally less likely to pursue employment, to supervise others, to care about money, et cetera, or whether this is something that they're taught by example from a young age. Across the globe, men and women are also varying in terms of the amount of time they spend on unpaid domestic tasks. So we can see here, um, what you see here is zero at, is the bottom point now, and it's number of hours spent weekly. And you can see that for almost all countries, women, who were the ones on the right in each of the small graphs, spend more time on housework and spend substantially more time on caring for family members. These and all the data I'm going to talk about are self-reported data. So these are reported by the sons and daughters themselves when they were between 18 and 60 years old. The measure we use of maternal employment is what scholars call noisy, blunt measures, um, which means if we find something, it's, it's a big effect because there's so much noise in the measure. The, measure differed across the two studies for the ISSP. It asked whether mothers ever worked, whether your mother ever worked for pay as long as one year before you were 14 years old. 
And in the GGP, it said, what was your mother's occupation when you were 15? And you could put unemployed, homemaker, professor, scientist, uh, machine worker. Um, as you can see, there's some range across the country. So Mexico was the lowest, 35% of people responded that their mothers had been employed. The Czech Republic is the highest. This is in general, um, most the um, post-Soviet bloc countries had much, much higher maternal employment. I'll describe the tests we use to get at the underlying mechanisms to try to deal with this really noisy measure. So generally, we ask whether maternal employment affects employment and domestic outcomes for sons and for daughters. On employment, we ask whether it affects the likelihood that you're gonna be employed at all. And if employed and controlling for employment and number of hours worked, what's the likelihood that you're gonna have supervisory responsibility and what are your earnings? And then the outcomes at home, we ask, engage, ask about engagement in household work and engagement in family care. And we're gonna explore whether these outcomes, if we see them, might be due to changes in gender attitudes by being raised by a mom that's employed or not employed. Past research would suggest that this would be the case, but we wanna test whether this might be the mechanism. And we then consider the role that social learning might play inside and outside the home. So we look at that this in a number of different ways that I'll explain as we go on. Research has found that gender attitudes vary from what's called traditional, which is beliefs in women should engage in unpaid labor at home and in the community, and men should engage in paid labor outside the home. And that's a fully exaggerated definition of traditional, um, all the way to the other end of the scale, which is egalitarian. And at the egalitarian end, men and women engage in both paid and unpaid labor, depending on their choices. And more specifically, these things are about beliefs about the appropriateness of these behaviors, responsibilities, and activities for men and for women. So the outcomes are based on a series of questions that ask, for example, to what extent do you would degree, agree or disagree with the statement that women should be at home and men should be earning the money for the family. Um, Exposure-based explanations of gender attitudes suggest that attitudes change when people encounter situations and beliefs of others, others that they respect. Role models shape the sense of possibility and, and, and lived experience. Gender role models, like your parents and other respected adults, provide women and men with both the what you should do and the how to navigate complex lives at home and at work. In career choice, parents' careers influence children's career choices. There's really robust evidence of this with fathers and sons, but much less so with mothers. Um, in another study of role models at work, Katie Milkman and I found that female lawyers are more likely to be promoted and less likely to leave the firm when they were in a work group with a higher proportion of female partners. In the exit interviews with women who had left and in interviews with associates and partners who stayed with the firm, women mentioned female partners as positive role models while the women who left the firm cited the absence of these role models in their work group as one of the primary reasons for seeking employment elsewhere. We also see this kind of evidence in education. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence that girls' choices are affected by women's teachers. And this appears to be especially true in STEM fields and at the college level. Although there doesn't appear to be a gender effect of teachers for boys. Research has shown us that men's gender attitudes are more traditional and women's are more egalitarian. And this is sort of self-serving if you think about it. So if traditional means I only have one choice and egalitarian means I have a host of choices, um, then it might be that women are sort of self-served. But what we see is that men's gender attitudes are really strongly affected by their mom's employment. So what you see on the left is maybe it's on the right for you guys, um, is that again, zero is the mean across all of our data. What you can see is that men have 
much more traditional gender attitudes if they were raised by moms who stayed at home full time than men who were raised by moms who were employed. Interestingly, we find that men raised by moms who were employed report more egalitarian gender attitudes than women raised by moms who didn't engage in paid employment. And that's that we've never seen that before. And it shows an incredibly powerful effect of these role models at home. What we found, now that you know the setup, is in the workplace, daughters of employed mothers, and again, this is always relative to uh, women who were raised by moms who stayed home full time, across these 29 countries were more likely to be employed, were more likely to supervise others, given that they were employed, and controlling for employment and hours have higher, in, higher annual earnings. All of these statistical analyses control for the respondent's age. I'm sorry for the snow plows in the background. Um, mother's years of education, mother's employment type, um, so the occupation, uh, the respondent's years of education, the respondent's marital status, the respondent's children at home, religion, year, and then fixed effects for country level social and economic indicators. So controlling for all of those things, women are more likely to be employed, more likely to supervise others and have higher earnings if their moms were also employed. In contrast, a son's exposures to mothers who were employed had no effect at all on men's employment. This suggests that the effects aren't about the financial aspects of maternal employment. If the effect were due to children growing up in households with more income, rather than something related to gender norms and their mother's behavior, it's very hard to explain why there would be no effects at all, positive or negative for sons. Though the analyses showed no significant association between mom's employment and son's employment outcomes, it could be that daughters benefit broadly while sons suffer if their moms are employed. So to test this possibility, we looked at, again, with a full set of controls, the relationship between maternal employment and children's well being outside deployment and domestic measures. So, we looked, for example, at sons and daughters' education and their reported life satisfaction. And again, this is all self report. The results showed no significant associations between maternal employment and self reported overall happiness for men or for women. Being raised by a mom that's employed or not employed isn't about whether your children are happy or satisfied with their lives. Turning to education, both sons and daughters of employed moms had significantly more education than children of mothers who were not employed. Um, and the effect sizes for boys and girls were not different. So it doesn't look like there's any suffering going on in sons. In fact, in contrast, and um, following up on Vinny's lead in, Men actually benefited at home. At home, employed mothers led their children to spend more time caring for family members and women spent less time on housework. Men didn't spend more or less time on housework. Unfortunately, it didn't have any effect on men contributing to the other household unpaid work, but they were spending more time with their families. Gender attitudes, as I mentioned earlier, significantly mediated, and that means this is the mechanism through which, which much of the relationship between mothers and daughters employment occurred. In other words, women raised by moms who were employed outside the home were more likely to hold egalitarian gender attitudes, and those attitudes in turn affected women's choices about their own employment as adults. Gender attitudes also significantly mediated the relationship between maternal employment and men's engagements in family care. So men who were raised by moms who were employed outside the home, again, held more egalitarian gender attitudes as you saw. And those attitudes in turn were significantly related to their involvement with caring for their own children. So now we're gonna to learn to this, turn to this question of social learning. Does role modeling matter too? So we investigated social learning as a mechanism by exploring the possibility that daughters 
when they become parents themselves, tap into skills they learned from their mothers during childhood. And if an adult daughter's behavioral repertoire draws on life skills gleaned from firsthand exposure to an employed mom, then the association between maternal employment and daughter's employment outcomes should be stronger for women with children at home, above and beyond the effects due to gender attitudes. And this is what we see once you control for the effects of gender attitudes. We can see here the graphic representation of social learning effects. So what you can see, again, on, I don't know whether it's your left or right, but um, women respondents with no children at home, the difference in engage uh, the number of hours they worked, for example, was no different between women who were raised by moms who were employed outside the home and those who did not engage in paid employment. But for women who had children at home, of course, the mean levels are lower. We know that women with children at home are less likely to be employed, but they're really less likely to be employed if they didn't have a role model helping them understand how to manage the complex dynamics of a household with moms and dads who are outside the workplace. We also saw the same effect on daughters' likelihood of supervising others. So what you can see is maternal employment does matter for the likelihood of supervising others, even if you don't have children at home, but the effect is whopping, that's a, that's a technical term. The effect is a whopping if, um, for women whose mothers were at home. And then we looked at the effects of social learning on sons. And what we found, which is really interesting for us, we said, well, if it's social learning, then it should be affected not just by your own mom, but by the experience that you see your friends having and what's happening in society around you. So we matched each respondent with the female labor force participation rate within the country they were raised when they were 14 years old. And what you see, can you see my, if you can see my pointer, what you can see here is that the um, effect of maternal employment, so the dotted line is for those who were raised by a mom who stayed at home full time. The solid line is for those who were raised by a mom who was engaging in paid employment. And when the female labor force participation rate within the country was when the son was young, was low, maternal employment doesn't matter. But the effect is significantly greater as the female, sort of as the women around in society are also employed. So what's happening here is we think that boys are learning to be involved in household care, not just in their own families, but in families that they experience as children. Here we see the full set of effects and mechanisms. So in Sun, and to quote some uh, adult sons and daughters that I have sat on a panel with a while back with their mothers discussing this research, the kids raised by employed moms are in their own words, we're doing fine. The daughters are doing better in paid employment and the sons are more involved with their families. Their children are more highly educated and there's no effect at all in self-reported happiness. The pandemic and the current upheaval in children's education and in parents' employment offers a potential opportunity to start to move this, one of the most stubborn bastions of inequality for women and men to be equally involved in their families' lives and in paid employment if they choose to do so. This time offers us a potential turning point where the gendered social order can be re-examined debated and reformed. My colleague, Ali Feldberg and I are studying this right now um, with about a thousand families across the last three years and we'll get back to you on what we learn. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, Kathleen, thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. And uh, I have to say that uh, I discovered your study uh, from a newsletter that I get from the um, Harvard Business School, and anybody can subscribe just going online, and uh, you get a newsletter about uh, different research projects that are going on at the, at the Harvard Business School, 
uh, for free. Uh, and it comes every uh, week or two, something like that. And uh, it's an amazing array of studies and uh, could be of some interest to people who are listening in. So it's easy to, uh, uh, to subscribe uh, and uh, I emphasize it's free. So thank Thanks, you very Jimmy. much, Kathleen. Um, we will allow for questions later. Uh, there is a chat box. So if you do have any questions, those of you who are listening, uh, please uh, send them along in the chat box and I will check it at the uh, end of our second speaker's presentation. And uh, we hope to um, answer most, if not all, of uh, whatever questions you, uh, you might have. So without further ado, let me get to our second speaker, who is uh, Catherine Stevens. Uh, Catherine has done a lot of studies uh, at, uh, on, on child uh, care, child reading, and various problems that crop up when parents work. Um, she was with the American Enterprise Institute for, I believe, six years and did numerous studies there. And at some point, she was inspired to uh, establish her own um, nonprofit uh, think tank, I think you're uh, qualified as, uh, only in November of last year. So this is an opportunity for you, Catherine, to let us know all about uh, this new organization. So maybe we will find some clients for you today. And um, um, you're going to focus a little bit more on some of the challenges uh, that uh, occur. And uh, I, for one, am very much concerned about, you know, our government here in the United States uh, pushing for more and more childcare and having more and more women um, uh, out in the uh, labor force. Uh, yes, we do have uh, uh, two jobs available for every person that's unemployed, which is a very unusual situation. Sorry to put that in, but I'm an economist and I just can't avoid <laughs> mentioning certain things at, at, at times. Uh, but enough from me uh, and uh, let me bring on um, Catherine Stevens uh, and let her um, say uh, quite a bit about her past studies and her uh, new organization. So Catherine, please take it away. Thank you so much, Finney. Um, and um, thank you all for um, being here, here in our virtual here today. Um, yeah, my name is Catherine Stevens and I have recently founded the Center on Child and Family Policy that is, as Benny just explained, um, focused specifically on these issues, um, particularly for families with young children. That's that's the the arena that a lot of the um, our current policy questions are focused on. Um, so um, today, I am going to be talking about maternal employment and child care. Um, for uh, preschool age kids. For older kids, uh, there are, are after school childcare programs, but mostly as many parents found out during the pandemic, uh, the childcare function is really played by the public schools. And people really noticed that when the schools in, were, were closed. Um, I'm going to focus on um, the policy questions around what we, um, at least in this country, think of when we think of a child care, which is um, caring for, for young children pr before they enter school. So let me um, do this whole screen sharing thing. That's always a little nerve wracking. Okay. <laughs> um, so I am, um, we did it in the, in the, in the uh, testing phase. So I have my, I just have to find my right um, sorry. Uh, let's see. I don't think this is, it, it, did that work? Yes, it did. Yes. It did. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, just, just a quick word about, uh, my own, uh, background as, as, as Kathleen has just pointed out people's home, own home, um, experiences as, as children shape for one way or another um, a lot about, about who they are and what they care about. Um, and I'm actually, I would say, a, very, a consistent data point with Kathleen's research in that um, my, my own mother um, was 
uh, what worked. She was a, a, a professor of music history. And when I was growing up uh, in Seattle, Washington in the 60s, she was the um, only mother that I knew who was working full time. So that was, you know, that, that, so I definitely, the, the, a, the, a child of, of, of a, of a very employed mother, her work has always been very important to her. Um, it's also interesting, just as a, as a side note, I don't have children. I am a com total career person. My younger sister um, is, uh, was a lawyer. And then when she had children, um, has ended up staying home with them full time. So my mom somehow managed to produce both those kids, um, and that whole dimension of, of this issue is very is fascinating to me. Um, so I'm going to focus on the, um, let's see here. Oops. My slides are, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so the, the, the key policy question um, that's really central at, um, in, 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 in many and certainly in the United States, and I think in many countries now, is around these around these questions of 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 maternal employment. Um, should we aim to um, increase publicly funded childcare? Um, there's been, as 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 people are probably aware, a growing push for publicly funded childcare as essential to maternal employment. Um, and advancing gender equality, as Kathleen's been been dis, um, been di ex discussing, advocates argue that it that increasing childcare is a crucial policy goal to enable women to pursue their careers, increase family earnings, and uh, boost national economies. Yet the desirability of increasing maternal employment through expanding child care remains hotly debated as many continue to worry that it may have an adverse effect on um young uh, on, on on children so the the key question is should we aim to increase publicly funded child care and the question of child care is fundamentally about it has very serious implications, clearly, for women, for families, but fundamentally, it's about with whom and in what environments young children are spending the very first years of their lives. So while women's careers and and and, and family income and GDP are, are clearly of great importance, in this policy area, I argue that advancing the well-being of, of, of children has to be our primary policy goal. So I think the, the core policy question is, will expanding childcare be good for children? Um, the the uh, work that, that, the really fascinating work that Kathleen's done, um, isn't able to shed light on the question that I'm focusing on. As she explained, um, the analyses rely on data from two surveys asking, did your mother ever work for pay for as long as one year after you were born and before you were 14? And what was your mother's occupation when you were 15? So this uh, definition of maternal employment um, enables obviously enables researchers to get at a lot of really interesting questions like the one she was discussing, but it includes everything from a mother of a ninth grader working part-time and a mother of an infant working 50 hours a week and the whole range in between that. So in other words, the, those, those, the survey's definitions of maternal employment are too broad to provide useful information of, about the effects of childcare. So what has research found? Research on childcare has found positive effects for some children, but also raises cause uh, for concern. There's a, in a broad range of studies of uh, across multiple countries, researchers have found positive impacts of high quality childcare. 
But those findings don't tell us about effects on specific children. Rather, they describe average effects on large numbers of children. And what we aren't paying enough attention to is that effects reported as averages in studies are almost always heterogeneous. That is, when you look at the findings closely, you see that impacts vary considerably among subgroups of children. Two um, researchers, uh, Christina uh, Felfe and Raphael uh, Laliv, uh, have um, who have done uh, who do research on childcare, have put it this way. Understanding effect heterogeneity is essential because early child care may both help and harm children. Similarly, um, the, the researchers, two researchers, uh, Michael um, Kotlinberg and Stephen Lehrer, have done a lot of work on a universal child care program that was launched in Quebec, Canada in 1987. Um, the, the program was, was uh, aimed to ensure what they quote, a healthy start for, for all children by providing high quality early care and education while simultaneously in enabling larger numbers of work mothers to join the workforce. And the workforce part worked. Uh, women's um, workforce participation increased uh, a lot from um, 74% in 1997, when the program started, to 87% in by 2018. So that is a huge jump. But longitudinal effects studies, um, the number of researchers have been have been have been have been look, looking at the the long term effects of of this universal program, and have found mixed effects on children. And these two researchers. Um, have have are have emphasized um, have studied that specifically that is specifically looked at heterogeneity in effects that they're finding writing despite traditional emphasis in the applied literature to report only mean effects of a policy the existence of treatment effect heterogeneity in education programs is now ever overwhelming. Policy changes generate both winners and losers, and as such, it is important to report distributional treatment effects in uh, empirical work. And researchers are finding that the effects of child care, these heterogeneous effects, vary depending on multiple factors. In general, researchers have found positive impacts for children from low income and single parent um, households, um, children with less educated mothers and children with immigrant parents. On the other hand, they found negative effects for children whose mothers have higher education for the, for, and for children from two parent households across the income uh, spectrum. Cotlinberg and Lehrer, um, found particular variation in the effects of Quebec's universal childcare program based on whether children were living in one or two parent households. They found large developmental gains for children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds from single parent families, but even but children even from lower socioeconomic backgrounds from two parent families were generally affected adversely. So the takeaway here is even high quality childcare is neither good nor bad across the board. What research is telling us is that for some children, the effects of high quality group care are positive while for others, the effects are negative. Findings of adverse effects do not mean that childcare harms all children. On the other hand, findings of positive or neutral effects don't prove that high quality childcare is, our own, is always harmless. So I think this nuance is something that's really critical in um, in considering uh, policy questions around childcare. 
And this is what researchers are finding, are arguing is the key drivers of this variation. Children's home environments. Child care increases parental workforce participation by decreasing the time that children spend at home and with parents. And in order to determine the effects of child care, we have to understand the quality of the alternative. So the effects of child care don't exist in a vacuum. They exist relative to what the effects would be of the of the of an alternative environment for children. Children from unstable home environments have been found to, uh, to benefit considerably from attending high quality care. At the same time, even high quality programs have an adverse effect on children when they displace or diminish higher quality home care. That is, in order to understand the impact of childcare on young children, we have to look both at what we're replacing and what we're replacing it with. The variation in home environments um, was a particular, um, uh, was the, the Quebec researchers um, found variation in home environments um, to be a particularly striking um, uh, cause of the variation and the effects of the program. So they found that there were positive effects for lower SES children from single parent families, arguing that that was because child care appears to substitute for lower levels of parental care or informal care arrangements. The negative effects they found, even for, for children from low, lower socioeconomic backgrounds who were from two parent families, they argued was because childcare was, as they put it, less than a perfect substitute for investments that were previously made in the home. In other words, even if the childcare was pretty good, what children were experiencing at, in, a, in, in particular kinds of stable homes was actually better for them. This is also, um, this is consistent with the findings of a well-known economist, um, James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winner at University of Chicago, who's done a lot of work studying the effects of early childhood programs. And he's written, the intervention that a loving, resourceful family gives to its children has huge benefits that unfortunately have never been measured well. Public preschool programs can potentially compensate for the home environments of disadvantaged children, but no public preschool program can provide the environments and the parental love and care of a functioning family and the lifetime benefits that ensue. In particular, I think we need to be especially concerned about early and extensive care. Birth to age three is been well established as the most crucial period of development. And the developmental needs of infants and toddlers are, are unique and critically different from those of preschoolers and older children. But most of the research that's been done on child care and child care's effects have, have been done on programs for preschoolers, three and four-year-olds. And we there's a real dearth of research on child care's effects on infants and toddlers in particular, and especially infants and toddlers who are spending large amounts of time 30, 40, 50 hours a week in um, group non-parental um, environments. The largest study on this question to date did find that extensive hours for infants and toddlers in, in non-parental group care um, 
were problematic. This was a longitudinal investigation that followed um, a group of almost 1400 children from birth onwards, started in the 1970s. And researchers found that on average, high quality childcare increased children's basic academic skills at kindergarten entry. But over several decades of research, they've also found that extensive hours in a childcare program especially during infancy and toddler toddlerhood in particular, predicted negative social emotional outcomes from preschool well into adolescence. So in addition to these studies of children in childcare, there's a, been a growing body of, of developmental science. It's really exploded over the last 10, 10, 10, 10 20 years, um, which is also a really important source of, 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 of knowledge um, to inform these kinds of policy questions. And what that developmental science tells us is that children are hardwired to develop within a small group of familiar people, a small stable group of familiar people and require a great deal of one-on-one -on -one nurturing uh, to develop well. In fact, for most of human history, children's early development unfolded in the context of, of, of homes with families, usually with, um, with full-time um, maternal care. Uh, surge of findings from neurobiological research over the past 10, 20 years has shown that the ongoing nurturing interactions that occur within young children's one-on-one -on -one relationships with parents and other close loving caregivers are literally shaping the child's growing uh, brain. But researchers are increasingly concerned that very young children's separation from a primary caregiver can cause stress and anxiety with potentially adverse effects on children's development. There's a fairly new body of research looking at this question that compares children's stress levels when they are in childcare and when they are at home. And this sheds new light on uh, potential, a, a potential driver of the negative impacts that have been found in studies of childcare. So the researchers assess uh, children's levels of, uh, they assess the levels of children's stress by measuring the levels in their, sa in their sal salivary uh, levels of the stress hormone cortisol that is produced in response to psychological or physical stress. And that the stress, when we're stressed, our, the stress, the hormone cortisol is, 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 um, appears in our saliva and can be easily measured. A growing number of studies using this method have found that some, not all, again, these are the, the, the studies can report averages, but there's a variation. Some children's stress levels increase significantly when they are in childcare and in particular full-time center-based care. Uh, as indicated by persistently elevated cortisol levels when they're in the childcare setting, setter, setting that disappear uh, over the weekend, say, when they're at home. And the effect of this, this very new body of research, the effect of this phenomenon is not precisely known, but we do know that persistently elevated stress during early childhood is a major risk factor for uh, adverse developmental outcomes. So this is really important research to be paying attention to. In uh, 2020, a group of uh, researchers published an article in um, the journal Epigenomics discussing what they see as the growing conflict between this increasingly large body of science and at the same time, an increasingly widespread use of childcare for children under age three. 
and argue that this conflict is has remained unexamined because of what they've described as a taboo on open debate on the on the question. They wrote, we have identified around a thousand research reports in different sciences spread over 30 years that separating small children from their mothers has a variety of adverse effects. However, we have not identified a systematic review in any leading medical journal. And as far as we know, this is the first editorial on this topic. So a few concluding thoughts. First of all, there's a strong body of research that shows very clearly that high quality childcare has significant benefits for children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and less stable home environments, particularly from single parent households. And those are the very children that have the very least access to high quality care. Boosting access to high quality care for those children is a, a, a really important policy goal. And I think merits substantially increased public uh, funding. At the same time though, the available evidence, both from childcare research and developmental science suggests that a large non-targeted expansion of publicly funded childcare for young children won't be in the best interests of young children overall. It's also really important to remember that certainly the people who are presenting in these kinds of, of, of forums are, um, are, are career-oriented people. That's why we're here. But lots and lots of parents don't have careers, they have jobs, and they would prefer to raise their own children, whether full or part-time. Or even, I would say, my, my sister, she had a career, she was a lawyer, and she still, her preference was to raise her, her, own, uh, her own children. And that's a really important piece of this picture. Um, as, as sort of underscoring this, um, a, a group called Public Agenda did a major survey of parents um, uh, several years ago um, who had children aged five or under. So that's a very particular group, parents with young children, and found that a high quality childcare center was the least preferred arrangement for almost half of the parents who, who were surveyed. Four out of five said that young children were less likely to get sufficient uh, affection and attention from caring, well-trained professionals in a high quality center than they would at home. And parents overwhelmingly said that they preferred parental care for their young children. Nine out of 10 said that if a family can afford it, it is almost always best for young children if one parent stays home with them full time more than one third said that for children under age two, it is absolutely essential. 80% of mothers and half of fathers in this survey said they would prefer to stay home themselves to care for their young children rather than work full time um, outside the home. At the same time, I've noticed that increasingly the project of raising young children is, is, is described as though it were a, a kind of an especially consuming household chore. But we need to remember that it actually means developing new human beings. That's not to say that mothers specifically must solely or even primarily carry it out. Increasingly, fathers are 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 willing and and eager to play a much larger role in um, in bringing up young children, but nor is it something that can be outsourced to paid strangers like house cleaning or washing the car. We need to remember that human development is a time and intensive a time and attention intensive process by its very nature. 
And I worry that our growing focus on related policy goals, like gender equality, increasing family income, and raising GDP is lead, leading us to leave out this essentially, this, this especially essential piece of the family picture. Thanks very much. Wonderful, Catherine. Thank you very much for a very uh, illuminating presentation. Um, I'm sure everybody listening in uh, have benefited a lot from what you had to say. Um, moderator usually gets the privilege of asking the first question, so I'm going to do that. Uh, let me ask uh, you, Catherine. Um, you mentioned, you know, high quality uh, care, and uh, you know, high quality was repeated quite a quite a few times, and it brought to mind a study that I saw just the other day from the U.S. Department of Labor. So this applies only for the United States. That uh, outside childcare is really very expensive. And uh, they did a study uh, actually county by county for most uh, uh, US states. And uh, as best as I can recall just offhand, it varied like from $4,000 a year to uh, 16,000 and counting uh, in a place like uh, Cook County, which includes Chicago. Uh, can you say something about, you know, child care and uh, how expensive it is and how that may be a consideration. Um, and also in providing uh, child care, uh, to what extent, as far as, I don't know if it can be measured or not, uh, do grandparents come in and um, uh, provide the care while the parents are working? I know this happens a lot in other countries. I mean, I'm of Italian background and I have some cousins in Italy. And uh, one, for example, retired at 57 uh, as soon as her children had children mm -hmm. to uh, mind, uh, you know, while yeah. the daughter pursued a, a law career, right. uh, for example. So if you can address those points, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. So I guess what I would underscore is that the research is pretty clear that um, age segregated non-parental group settings are simply not optimal for, for, for young children's development. We're just not hard, we're not born in litters. We're, 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 we're not hardwired to develop. And again, I'm talking about young children. I'm not talking even about four or five-year-olds, right? We're not hardwired to develop in those settings. The, what the, 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 the optimal conditions are uh, small, familiar settings with 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 loving, um, um, I'm going to say the word family members. It doesn't have to be a family member, but people who are like family to you as a as a as a as a very young child. And so, what I quality childcare is enormously expensive. And the the, the one policy solution is, I mean, so K twelve is also very expensive. We're spending. Um, we're spending on average across the country, I think $13,000 a year per kid. Education's expensive. So one policy solution could be, well, we'll just pay that money. The problem with that is that even the very highest quality group care still is not providing the optimal developmental conditions. Most of the wealthy people, wealthy, I don't by say wealthy, I mean wealthier, right? More affluent people that I know, including people who work in childcare advocacy, when they have the money, they they hire a nanny with by themselves or a shared nanny, which is an increasingly, um, I think an increasingly interesting, interesting um, it, it's an increasing phenomenon, a shared nanny. So it's your kid and one other kid, that ends up costing about the same as high quality care, but it's it is it's more consistent with with child with with what children need to develop well and the 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 from a from the point of view of a young child I mean they're not doing DNA tests you know and gender tests to figure out who it is who's taking care of them so it does not have to be a blood relation and it doesn't have to be it certainly doesn't have to be the mother there's there's I 
I there's there, certainly there are people who are are very focused on that dimension of 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 the situation, but I I don't think that's the crucial depth the crucial um, issue. It is it is it is a great um, tragedy for young children in this country that there are not more grandparents available because that's kind of ideal. And as a matter of fact, Elizabeth Warren is well known for at this at these days um, being being promoting universal um, group childcare. But when she talks about it, it's very interesting because when she describes how she herself managed to to go on with her career, which is of enormous importance to her, as mine is to my, to me, she didn't put her children in group childcare. She had Aunt B. She was sobbing on the phone to Aunt B, explaining that that she, this just she was not able to put the pieces together as many many women are not. And Aunt B got on the airplane with six suitcases and her beagle, and stayed with them for twelve years. So if if the policy uh, proposal on the table was, you know, an aunt B in every home. That to me would make a lot of sense and would be worth spending money on. Um, if you have a society that's set up so that grandparents can play a bigger role, that's also uh, ideal. Um, but 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 that those those aunt B's and grandparents are are are, are, are radically different for young children than. Um, group, non-parental group settings um, that are on top of it age segregated, even in small groups, it's still, it's still just not the right conditions for young children. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, I've got a question, well, several questions, but I'm going to limit it to one if I can <laughs> restrain myself. Um, the United States is the only country that doesn't have a national or government uh, sponsored uh, maternity leave. Uh, of course, a generous uh, maternity leave can be offered by a large corporate uh, entity, and I'm sure they do. Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, some countries uh, offer not only a maternity leave, but a paternity leave. Uh, there was a graph that appeared in the Financial Times just a couple of days ago. Uh, that showed the extent of uh, paternity leave that is given in some other countries. And it is really quite impressive. They show a tremendous amount. I, it's difficult to figure out how many weeks in this little chart, but they put South Korea, Japan, uh, and France at the very top of this. Um, I don't know whether in your studies you've looked at maternity leave and paternity leave and uh, how beneficial or not uh, uh, these particular plans might be? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I have not in my research, um, in the States it's happening as, as um, all of you no doubt know, um, in this federal system, we do experiments at the state level. Um, there are multiple States now that are um, requiring paid uh, maternity leave. Massachusetts is one of the states that's requiring paid leave for, for um, both the um, childbearing parent and the other parent, um, if there are two parents involved. Um, I think we have, there is a lot, um, there are many experiments going on. We can see how it works in the US. There is a slew of research that looks at the effects across countries. Um, so there's quite a bit of work going on um, by economists in the Nordic countries showing the effects there. And it's quite mixed in the sense of it's very, it is very hard to create true equal access to family care so that, and, and on this, I completely agree with Catherine, so that both parents have an opportunity to spend really important developmental time with their child very, very early on. Um, countries are trying lots of different experiments with that. Uh, it, has, it has not, we have not gotten to exactly right, but the Nordic countries in Germany are getting close. One of the things that's pretty clear doesn't work and sort of reinforces this father's not involved, mother drops out of the workforce for a while, jumps back in the workforce when they run out of money, um, is some countries have basically said, we'll give mothers uh, contiguous to the birth event, and then we'll give fathers any time within X number of years, and some of, some of it's tradable to the mother. And it turns out that that basically doesn't, doesn't 
increase father's involvement at all. Um, so there's lots of experiments going on. I think we'll know a lot more in five, 10 years, um, but there's quite a bit of good research going on in the European countries. And, and I highly encourage you to bring somebody on to talk about that research. It's really important research. Okay, thanks for giving us some ideas as to uh, future meetings we can have. Maybe we can have uh, both of you back at some point and uh, uh, bring us up to date because as we all know, the labor force has changed dramatically since the pandemic. And uh, you know, more men uh, had, were forced to work from home, just like a lot of women uh, had an arrangement to work part-time or full-time from home. Uh, and when the men uh, joined that particular, joined the women at home, they decided, hey, this is great. We like it. We don't want to go back to the office. And even today, uh, you know, you walk around Park Avenue or Wall Street and uh, you just don't see the crowds that you used to see uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, so things are generally uh, changing and we uh, probably am going to need some analysis on that uh, going into the future. Uh, can I, Vinny, I can I make a quick comment? Sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to underscore kind of building on exactly what you just said. The, the I think th there are there are when we the way we have the way economists, as you probably know, tend to have this conversation is with a very strong bias towards paid employment. And that bias hurts men and women. So on in both genders, there are many women for whom staying at home is a choice. It is something they want to do. They, it's not something they're they feel forced into. It's something that they feel is it's what it's what they want to do. And frankly, the pressure towards valuing adults in terms of their paid employment, which has long affected women's status. Um, is has a, has this downside for men, which is that they are haven't haven't been allowed to consider the option of staying home with children. So I think the bot that in general for both genders to elevate the import it, it makes it is it is it, it it will be helpful to both genders to elevate the importance the value of being at home raising young children rather than framing the issue entirely in terms of the value of, of, of working for pay out, outside the home. Okay, I'm so, trying to- uh, I'm just gonna yeah. interject on- Sure, on, Kathleen, on go ahead. Catherine's point, I, I fully agree. If we could get to a world where um, paid and unpaid labor are equally valued, I mean, that's paradise, right? So, th so that would be great. Um, you know, in, in lieu of that world and in lieu of a world where all uh, parents are able to somehow find the resources um, to step out of uh, the workforce from three years while their kids are young, um, in absent that world, we, we do need to provide, and again, I fully agree with Catherine, um, the, the quality, the size, we even know from classrooms, like big classrooms aren't a good thing either. Um, the quality, the size of, of uh, the care we provide our children absolutely matters. Um, and, and that's very, very, very expensive. So in a, in, in a perfect world, paid and unpaid labor are valued equally and everybody has resources, but we just don't live in that world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking at the chat box and um, here's one question I think is for you, Kathleen. It says, excellent. Encouraging information. I wish I could take your class. <laughs> One concern is decrease in interest in marriage and having children. Uh, and there's a reference to falling birth rates and things of that nature. Um, so we have really no time left over, but very briefly, could you address that? Yeah, so there's no evidence in our data that women are raised by employed moms are less likely to be married. There is evidence that men raised by employed moms are more likely to um, support their wives. So, so I think the, um, regardless of the choice that their wife makes. Um, so I think, I think the really positive thing here is the effect of employed moms. And again, I, I completely agree with Catherine that 
we should value unpaid labor the same. Nonetheless, um, employed moms do teach their sons that caring for children isn't just a woman's job and caring for their wives is a really important thing to do. So it's, there's some positive effects there. It didn't have any effect on the marriage rates for women. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid uh, we've surpassed, we usually uh, end our meetings at 2.30 and we're a little bit beyond that. Uh, so I'm sorry I have to say uh, goodbye to everybody, but before I do that, uh, let me thank, uh, and uh, I don't know, I'm, you can hear me, so I'm definitely clapping, and uh, <laughs> the others who are muted are also showing their appreciation uh, to both uh, you, Kathleen, and Catherine, you did a wonderful job and uh, really gave us a lot of information, a lot of food for thought, and we're very, very grateful for your uh, presence and participation today. Thank you very, very much. And for everyone still attending, if you haven't fallen asleep, I just wanna remind you, we're gonna have another uh, meeting that is gonna be dealing with families and technology or something like that. The title is too long for me to remember at this point. Uh, and that's going to be uh, on March 16th, I believe. And uh, if not, uh, you will get, uh, sorry? March 9th. March 9th, oh, okay, we changed okay. it again. Okay, March 9th. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we will, uh, Sophia, of course, will be the one who will send you uh, an email uh, inviting you all to come back and uh, bring a friend too. So once again, thank you all for those of you who have uh, attended the meeting. And once again, thanks again to Kathleen and Catherine. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Take care. Bye-bye. everyone. Thank you.